Good morning. <laughs> Welcome to Grace United Methodist Church as we gather for our 10 o'clock service. A good morning to all who are joining us uh, via Zoom, Facebook Live, and to all who are gathered here. I am Jim Miller, along with Deacon Helen Ballou. We'll be leading you in our worship service. Thank you for your presence. Your faithfulness is making such a difference in the ministries of the church. If you would like to learn more about what is happening, I hope that you are receiving our weekly email or our mailed version of Grace Notes. If you just go to our church website at graceumc.org, you can subscribe to Grace Notes. That's your weekly letter that tells you all that's happening in the life of the church. If you are joining us for the very first time, welcome. We're so glad and honored to have this opportunity to worship with you. Today we continue in our series of what does it mean to be a disciple? What does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? Well, you're off to a great start. You're here to worship. You're taking time. You're honoring the Sabbath by allowing Christ to minister to you. So to clear our minds and unplug from the world, let us just now prepare our hearts to worship as Betsy Moore shares with us our morning prelude. Please join me in the call to worship. Happy are those who follow the ways of the Lord. Merciful. Those who follow God's ways are continually nourished in faith. 
and all that they do, that they prosper. Come, let us open our hearts to God's compassionate love. Let us celebrate God's mercy and justice. Let's join our voices together in the opening prayer. Lord, Lord be, be with, with us, us this day, day helping, helping us, us to, to put our priorities, priorities in order, order so that so we, we may faithfully, faithfully serve, serve you by serving, serving your people. people. Heal, Heal our spirits. Spirit. Enable us to follow your ways all the days of our lives. Amen. And now I invite you to stand as you are able for our opening hymn, Lord Speak to Me, number 463. Lord, speak to me that I may speak in living echoes of thy tone. As thou hast sought, so let me seek thy erring children lost and lone. O oh, strengthen me while I stand firm on the rock and strong in thee, I may stretch out a loving hand to wrestlers with the troubled sea. Oh, teach me, Lord, that I may teach the precious things thou dost impart and wing my words that they may reach the hidden depths of many a heart oh fill me with thy fullness lord until my very heart overflow in kindling thought and glowing word thy love to tell thy praise to show oh use me lord use even me just as thou wilt and when and where until thy blessed face i see thy rest thy joy thy glory share please be seated good morning friends each one of us has a unique story to tell about our experiences with race or racism. Taking time to reflect on these experiences and sharing them with others is part of learning and growing together as God's beloved community. I give thanks to God for the courage and the honesty of the We Rise United team members who have been sharing their stories in group meetings and during worship. And I invite each one of you to consider your own thoughts and experiences with racial justice and injustice in the light of Christ's love. As we engage in these times of sharing, you might feel pain, confusion, hope, or healing. Please reach out to Pastor Jim or me if you are struggling, or if you have a story of your own to share, or questions to ask. All of you are also welcome and encouraged to attend the next We Rise United meeting on Sunday, October 11th at 1.30 using the church Zoom link. And now it's a blessing and a privilege to introduce Carol Rose as she shares her story with us this morning.
Good morning. I'm going to tell you a story about the first time I heard the term white privilege. The year was 1970, and I had been home from Kenya for one year after spending two years in predominantly rural Kenya. One year at Boston University had not helped me stop feeling like a total stranger in my own culture and country. On a friend's recommendation, I enrolled in a sensitivity training class, which was a small group to work on self-awareness and communication. At the first meeting, we were sitting around in a circle, just looking at each other in silence. A black woman walked in, looked at the group, and said, oh, you are all white, and I'm the only black. Some participants said in unison, I really didn't notice. As she walked out of the room, she replied, not noticing color is your white privilege. When you're black, you are always aware and you always notice. And you can tell that after all this time, she made a big impression on me. Carol, thank you. Your sharing has made a powerful impression upon us. We appreciate it so much. And the continued work of We Rise United, as Deacon Helen shared with you, will continue our next gathering again Sunday afternoon, October 11th, where we not only share our story, but take our next steps in building and celebrating the diversity that God has blessed us with and in overcoming racism. Thank you, Carol, so much. Today we are celebrating our kids' ministry, some portions of our children's ministries, and this morning we are going to have a special opportunity to hear from Lauren Muir, who's going to talk with us about our kids' club. And I see Terry Fowler, who is, uh, lives and breathes our children's ministries. And Terry, we thank you for all that you are doing. Lauren, we'll turn to you, please. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Lauren and I've been a returning member of Kids Club for uh, six years now. I like it so much I keep coming back. <laughs> I'm in 10th grade, I keep coming back. Uh, so one of my favorite ministries that we do is the snow tubing, because you never know who you're going to see, because last time I saw my history teacher there. <laughs> Fun times. And you get to go snow tubing with your friends for about two hours and it's a good time. But we also do some ministries, and you get to do community service, like making a meal for the women's shelter and the spirit of giving here at Grace for, during Christmas time. And it's always a lot of fun. Um, and I highly encourage, if you are of age and you're able to, to come do Kids Club because it's so much fun, and you get to make a lot of friends. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, as Lauren said, Kids Club is a ministry that typically starts in fourth through sixth grade, but doesn't end. We have children who become teens who come back to assist and who hang out because they enjoy it. Also, third graders who are turning nine, we call those the rising third graders, are also eligible to join. Information will be on the website. We also have uh, information in the narthex for your forms to fill out. Each year we ask that the parents fill out the forms for the children. As Lauren mentioned, we do a variety of activities. Uh, we completed our backpack drive in August where we stuffed 155 backpacks 
for children in need, and it went to the entire family for children who attended Southlake in, in Gaithersburg Elementary School. Our next event, we are reaching out to the community with our trunk and treat on October 30th. So we ask you to join us for that day, participate as you are able. There's a sign up genius for it. And we'll start preparing for our spirit of giving in which we take gifts for children in need again at Christmas. And we will once again be connecting with linkages to learning and they connect us with some of the families that have the greatest need in the surrounding area. So we thank you for your support. If you have any questions, you can reach me at kidsclub at graceumc.org. And we welcome children of all ages to help us with this ministry because we cannot do it alone. Thank you. Thank you, Terry and Lauren. Thank you so much for the sharing and for the opportunity for our children to gather together. Another part of our children's ministry is our children's music ministry. And at this time, we're going to have a special music from our M&M singers. Thank you so much, Keegan, Ava, and Anna Marie. Powerful. Thank you. And Betsy. Thank you. I invite all who are able to please stand as I share our gospel lesson.
A reading from the Gospel according to Mark, the ninth chapter, beginning with the 30th verse. They went on from there and passed through Galilee. He did not want anyone to know it, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him, and three days after being killed, he will rise again. But they did not understand what he was saying and were afraid to ask him. Then they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent, for on the way they had argued with one another who was the greatest. He sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. Then he took a little child and put it among them. Taking it in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. I invite you to pray with me. Lord, we thank you. Thank you for being our teacher and our friend. You really do care if we get it. You want fulfillment for each and every one of us and for all. Lord, many do not know this good news. Many think it's too late or can never change. But time and time again, we're reminded that even when your closest of followers didn't get, you never gave up on them. You continued to fulfill your mission to bring the gift of salvation. Lord, it is this wholeness that we want, that we need, and pray that through this time of reflection upon your word, that your Holy Spirit will do just that. Do in us what we could never do for ourselves, and that is make us whole. By your grace, you have invited us here, and through grace, the journey continues. Allow your Holy Spirit to use this time to your honor, to your glory, we pray, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Starting this month, the Baltimore-Washington Conference that we are part of, and the Peninsula-Delaware Conference are now being aligned, and Bishop Easterling will be leading both annual conferences. I feel like this is where I came in, because when I first began seminary and served as a student pastor, I was assigned to the Peninsula-Delaware Conference, under then Bishop Joe Yackel, who just recently went home with the Lord. Bishop Yackel would often say, keep the main thing the main thing. In other words, make it about Jesus, everything that you do in ministry. I fondly remember my first congregation serving on the eastern shore. This is Ames United Methodist Church in Hobbs, Maryland. And that's right on the corner, and that's just about the town of Hobbs. I'm the second on the right there being seated. Now, I haven't changed a bit, have I, since 1988? <laughs> no comments, please. In fact, that little entrance area behind us there was built on the church during my time there because prior to that, when you walked in the church doors, you walked in the church. You walked right into the sanctuary. And on a cold winter morning when the winds were blowing, Everyone knew when you arrived, so it was a, a gift of hospitality that this entrance was, was built and a time capsule placed in it to be opened in, nine, in 2039, to which I have an invitation to return to and pray and plan on being there. What I am learning, what I'm finding out in ministry, is the fact that there are good people everywhere. Wherever I've had the privilege to serve and to be in ministry, 
I have met good people, and I think of all the places I've had opportunity to travel. It's been such a joy, such an uplifting experience to meet this wonderful diversity of God's creation and learn about one another. This is a gift, and I celebrate the gift we experience as a congregation in this wonderful diversity and the opportunity to grow and to learn and to hear the powerful testimonies such as Carol shared with us this morning and others have brought. We are learning. We are journeying together. To me, that's what we see happening in Mark's Gospel. We're told that Jesus was traveling with his disciples to, to Galilee. And Mark makes it a point to tell us this, because I don't think Mark is just sharing with us, well, they, they walked, they traveled, they didn't have cars in, but rather, we see that they were journeying together. And that, to me, is what we are invited to be part of as followers of Jesus Christ, what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ is the glorious news that he journeys with us. I loved serving Eastern Shore. One of the first things I was invited to was a crab feast. Now, growing up in Northeast Ohio, we didn't have crab feasts. We didn't have seafood much as a staple, or rather a red lobster was about as far as one went to experience a seafood. And I must say, the first time I was invited there in uh, Hooper's Island and, and going there, I wasn't so sure when I saw this brown paper being rolled out on the table there and this bushel of crabs being dumped right there and people putting their hands in it just began to, uh, this art of, of picking the crabs and, and consuming them. I confess that first time I ordered the all-you-can-eat fried chicken and sweet corn instead of indulging in this practice. Of course, in just a few minutes, I had consumed my meal. I, I was done. But what I learned was a crab feast. They had just begun. You see, it wasn't so much about eating the crab meat, and I've since learned to appreciate it, and it's very good. It's the experience. It's being at table together. It's being in one another's presence. And I think that is so important in our discipleship, that time together. That's what Jesus was offering his disciples as they journeyed together. He was offering some very powerful teachings. He was telling them, after all, he, for the second time about his passion, how he was going in Jerusalem, how he was going to suffer and die and rise again. And they were very quiet. They were afraid. And you can't blame them. Perhaps you are here today viewing this service here in person. Maybe you carry fear in your life. Fear of what's happening with COVID and variants. Fears of what's happening with loved ones or world events. We don't have to go back to biblical time to name fears. We could spend the remainder of this time naming the fears that we have. But notice what Jesus did, how he preceded them, giving them this powerful teaching, even though fear may have been getting the best of them in the moment. Jesus was still there for them. That grace that goes before us. That's such a comfort to know that our Savior goes before us. There isn't a fear, real or perceived, that we are dealing with this day that Christ hasn't already thought of, that Christ has not already cared for and is caring for us as we move through this time, as he journeys with us. I'm grateful for those who go before us. I've often mentioned my grandfather, whose farm I helped with mowing the grass growing up in that in Ohio. I had never been to the eastern shore before I went there in ministry, but he would sometimes talk about it because here he was born there near St. Michael and McDaniel and later made the journey to settle in Ohio. 
And when I would be there mowing the grass at weekly work, he would often sit outside watching me, and he'd sit on this apple crate, and he would motion to me to pause, to turn off the mower and to come over and, and sit down and be hydrated and take a moment to rest. And it would be in those moments that he would share those stories, like the eastern shore and life there or growing up. And I confess there were times I, I just wanted to get the lawn mowed. I just wanted to get the job done so I could go on my way. But oh, how I came and do cherish those moments now of when he took that time to talk and to listen to me. Years later, when I began full-time work, I met a co-worker, and he told me how he lived in the same town as my grandfather's farm. He said, I know your grandfather. I met him. And the young man went on to say how one day his dog ran away. And he was chasing, and the dog wouldn't come to him. And the boy was crying, and the dog ended up on my grandfather's farm. And my grandfather was outside. He saw the boy and saw the dog. And my grandfather just whistled and called the dog, and it came right to him. The little boy said, I was so relieved he helped reunite us. And I just loved that, that story. And just think back to that, what powerful memory that brings. And that's the kind of ministry that I have witnessed taking place right here at Grace. Or time and time again, I've encountered folks that said, yes, I was in need, and it was the church, it was the kids' club, or it was that, that meal together, that act of hospitality, it was that outreach into the community of ESL where I was reminded where I first learned or where I began again to journey with Christ. It's that kind of hospitality. People don't forget and I'm sure if you each had the opportunity to tell your story, it can be as simple as one expression as Carol talked about there, where we learn and learn from each other. Jesus used this moment to teach his disciples. When they got to the house, we're, we're told when they were there, Jesus said, so what were you arguing about on the way? There was silence. This is about as quiet as we ever find the disciples, as we see in this passage. Well, they were embarrassed because what they'd been arguing about on the way was which one of them, who would be the greatest? Jesus, he knew. I, I believe he knew what, what they had been arguing about. And it wasn't the fact that he was just seeking to add or to make them feel embarrassed, to add shame to the fear that they were already experiencing. Instead, Jesus used it as a teaching moment. Jesus used it as that teaching moment. And to our, all of our teachers and all who, who work with our students, we are, we are so grateful for you. And we continue to keep you in prayer as you, as you find your way in these incredibly challenging times. Someone once said, a mediocre teacher will tell you something. A good teacher will explain it. A superior teacher will demonstrate it. A great teacher will inspire you. In Christ and through Christ, I am grateful for those people in our lives who inspire us through their powerful words and through their actions. Here were these ones who in this moment, they were Jesus' closest of followers who needed that moment of inspiration. Maybe that's what you come seeking this day. Maybe the journey has become wearisome to you. You're zoomed out. You're so tired of safety protocols and all that we have to do to gather together. I get it. These disciples, they had journeyed with Jesus. They had been through a lot. That doesn't mean that it, they always have it together. We all struggle. Well, it was just a couple of weeks ago, I was, there was a decision I had to make, and it was really weighing on my heart as to what was the, the right thing to do. And I, was, I had prayed about it, and it just wasn't becoming clear to me. I had taken our van for an oil change. 
Again, it was my grandfather because whenever I used his lawnmower or any machinery, he said, Jimmy, always check the oil. Oil's cheaper than machinery, he would drill into my head. So I, I've been good about getting oil changes and that. So I went for that and I thought, well, while I wait, I'll go to this little cafe across the street, waiting for the van to be finished and think and pray some more about this decision. Well, I went over there. Here sat two of my colleagues who were eating outside and said hello to them. They invited me to join them. I said, no, 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 you planned your lunch. You didn't pl No, please. And so we sat down together. And somewhere in that conversation, I couldn't share what exactly it was I was struggling with, but in that conversation, the answer that one gave to the other came the teaching that I needed to hear and the clarity that I had been searching for became known to me. That was a teaching moment to me where God is at work in this journey, this journey where you don't always have the answers, they're not always crystal clear. God is still there for us as Jesus was there for his disciples. It was the great Methodist missionary and teacher, E. Stanley Jones, he writes this account. E. Stanley Jones was once described as the Billy Graham to the country of India. His work with Gandhi and his work of spreading the good news. In fact, their daughter, Eunice, married to Bishop James Matthews. I had the privilege to, to meet her and for their sharing. She once shared how it was Dr. Martin Luther King Jr who said to E. Stanley and thanked him for teaching him the methods of nonviolence that would be applied to the civil rights movement. Scholar, professor, pastor, world known, Nobel Peace Prize. Yet, in this account, hear what E. Stanley Jones had to say. He writes the following. I was running under cloudless skies, and then I suddenly tripped, almost fell, pulled back this side of sin, but was shaken and humiliated that I could come that close to sin. I thought I was emancipated and found I wasn't. I went to the class meeting. I'm grateful that I didn't stay away. I went, but my spiritual music had gone. I had hung my harp on a weeping willow tree. As the others spoke of their joys and victories of the week, I sat there with tears rolling down my cheeks. I was heartbroken. After the others had spoken, John Zink, the class leader, said, Now, Stanley, tell us what is the matter. I told them I couldn't. But would they please pray for me? They fell to their knees, and they lifted me back to the bosom of God by faith and love. When we got up from our knees, I was reconciled to my Heavenly Father, to the group and to myself. I was reconciled. The universe opened its arms and took me in again. The estrangement was gone. I took my harp from the willow tree and began to sing again. That powerful class meeting, that practice of hospitality, even though Stanley couldn't tell him what it was exactly that was going on, they prayed with him. Do you have such a group? I pray, whether it's through our, our weekly prayer meetings, our Bible studies, our youth group, our, our kids club, our choir, all who gather, yes, for the purpose of study, the purpose of singing, but there's something very powerful in these fellowships, this loving accountability. That's what Jesus was offering when we talk about hospitality they'd been arguing about. Then he went on to say to them, those who want to be first must be last of all and servant of all. You hear the term more and more, and it's a good term. Servant leadership. This is what Jesus was teaching in this if you want to be first, he could have been first by the world standards, after all. 
How many times did they want to crown Jesus king? How many times did they want to make him the ruler of any particular town or community? And being his disciples, well, that meant they would be close to him. They, they would be on easy street, wouldn't they? No, that's not the kind of hospitality that Jesus was offering. Instead, this model of servant leadership, he then took a child placed a child right there in the middle of their gathering. Now again, you, you have to think back to the culture and to that time. When we think of children coming forward for a children's moment or when they're able to be here in person and sing, they're, they're adorable. <laughs> they're, they're cute, you just treasure that. But that's not how children were seen in biblical time. They were seen as a nuisance, they were seen as someone's, not really someone's, but property that sort of had to be tolerated until they could grow up and become useful adults. They were outsiders, outcasts. But what did Jesus do? As this servant leader, he brought this child, put this child right there in the middle of their gathering. It said when, when you welcome this child, you, you welcome not me, but also you welcome the one who sent me. A powerful teaching. How might we teach through our service to Christ? I'm grateful for my teachers. One of my favorite seminary instructors was Dr. Douglas Strong. You may have known the Strongs. They lived in Olney for a while, and then he went on to be dean at the Seattle Pacific University. I remember when he gained full tenure and was named a pastor of church history, professor of church history. We congratulated him that next day in class, and somebody asked him, so what'd you do this week? And he said, what did I do? Well, I taught youth group last night. Here he was reaching the pillar of, of his career as a distinguished professor, and he was serving in the life of the church and youth ministry. We saw it as well with former President Jimmy Carter. Well into his 90s, still teaches. Some of you have been to it, and that must be a great experience, his adult Sunday school class that he would teach. Here's, here's a former president teaching the lesson. I love the story where it was near Thanksgiving time. He taught the lesson, and it was on service. Being Thanksgiving, they said, we should do a Thanksgiving meal for a family in need. And the whole class said, yes, we should do that. So they each took on an assignment of what they would bring. And the next Sunday they came and everybody had, had their food and they were ready to prepare this meal. And then he asked the question, so who knows a needy family? No one knew. The servant leadership and the lesson that day, pointing to Jesus as we have in our stained glass window, do we have those in need, those considered the outcasts on the fringes of society, should they not be at the heart and center of our ministries? I would learn it myself in a similar way. I was helping with the youth group and we decided we would take on, as we do with the angel tree or Terry mentioned for Christmas gifts, we were going to do Thanksgiving meals and did that as a congregation. So our youth group took on two or three ourselves and so the time came to deliver these meals. We split up and so I took a group of about four youth and we went to this home. It couldn't have been more heart touching. The woman came to the door and she saw the meal and who we were and she just thanked us. She began to cry. She said, you know, I lost my job and my husband's disabled. I told my family we just couldn't do Thanksgiving this year and, and here you are. There were hugs and there, I don't think there was a dry eye. Then we went on to our next delivery. You could hear the football game as we went up the steps. We went to the door and there was this biggest screen TV I think I've ever seen. 
It was the Cowboys Redskins back in the day when that was a great rivalry and the game was playing, the beer was flowing, and here was a, like a party going on and we were showing up to help out with food in need. I remember thinking to myself and later and reflecting that what we experienced was a different kind of poverty. But I'm not just speaking of who we took the food to at that party. But I began to catch myself what judgments, what conclusions I was reaching in my mind. And I thought of that story as I look at this lesson. For these disciples, they may not have got it right. And there may be, and there are, people in our world who are not getting it right, have priorities, have gone towards other things. But Jesus did not condemn them, even though these disciples were worried about who's going to be the greatest and were staying quiet about their fears. This didn't stop Jesus from doing what he did. He continued to Jerusalem. He continued to give his life. He continued to die on the cross and rise again so that all may come to fulfillment. Remember, Jesus said, Whoever does it for one of the least of these does it not only to me, but to the one who sent me. Whoever does this in my name. That in my name refers to everything Jesus is and what he is about. He didn't let the disciples not getting it keep him from doing what he came to do. We can't let our own judgments, our own places of growth that we still need to address in our lives or in our life together. Even though there are times we don't get it right, we cannot let that stop us from pursuing the one who comes for us. One pastor put it this way. You could almost sum up this section of the gospel in three prayer statements. Lord, help us. Lord, have mercy. And thanks be to God. Lord, help us when our fears overwhelm us, when this is too much, when Jesus talks about what he's going to be doing, about what needs to be done. Lord, help us when fear gets the best of us. Lord, have mercy when our thoughts turn towards what we can gain, what's in it for me. How will I look? Will I be great? In my definitions of greatness, Lord, have mercy. And even though we fall short, Thanks be to God, the gift of salvation and of wholeness is still ours to know and to experience the hospitality Christ offers this day is the wholeness that no one else can provide. And it's ours to know, and through Christ it's ours to overcome, that we may allow him to reign once again in our lives. Thanks be to God for a Savior who unconditionally loves serves, and leads us. Amen. In response to the word, I invite you to, well, actually, I gave you some challenges here. I want you almost left your homework out. What kind of teacher is that? Here's your homework for this week. Okay. So it's so easy to claim the promise of resurrection but avoid the demands of the cross. So what have we been avoiding in our walk with Christ? First, think about that. What have we been avoiding in our walk with Christ? Secondly, Jesus offers new categories for determining success and failure, winning and losing, achievement and fulfillment. Reflect on what it does truly mean to be great according to Christ. What does it mean to be great according to Christ? And lastly, Jesus teaches and demonstrates servant leadership in the community by receiving a child. How can we each grow a relationship with someone who is vulnerable or considered by many to be an outsider? I think of our work. There'll be a gathering today at 1.30, same Zoom you got here, about our work with the Afghan refugees, for example. How can we grow such a relationship? Now, in response, let us join together as we offer our prayer of confession. Let us pray. God of patience and mercy, we come come to you offering lip service service to serving you. you. But when When things things get get difficult, difficult, 
When we are called to do something which is hard for us, we shy away from the duty and the opportunity. We turn our back on service out of fear of failure. Forgive us, gracious Lord. Heal our fears and our weaknesses. Strengthen us and give us courage to truly be your disciples, not counting the rewards, but rejoicing in the work. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hear these words of assurance. This day the Lord reaches out to you in healing love and compassion. Receive the blessings which God offers to you. Be healed and made whole. Be ready to serve. Amen. We give thanks for the opportunity. We have our offering plate here for those in person and also the opportunities to give online. One of the ways we give back, one of the ways we participate in the journey is through our weekly offerings. We give thanks for your faithfulness. Your faithfulness is making a difference. Your faithfulness has helped bringing the message of Jesus Christ to a world living in fear. I give thanks for your giving. Amen. At this time, Deacon Helen will be leading us in our morning prayer. Sisters and brothers, let us pray. Creator, on this day, your day, we wake in your love. We rise in your love. We come together in your love. Help us to stop competing, comparing, and complaining. Help us to make room for one another and our neighbors as we travel together, serve together, and grow together. Help us to come home, to be at home, to welcome others home with your love. Jesus, on this day, your day, we cry out to you. There are many in this church and in our community who are bearing burdens. Help us to carry them together. In your mercy, hear our prayers and move hearts for people who are suffering from illness, injustice, loss of livelihood, loss of loved ones, loss of hope, for communities experiencing change, crisis, or uncertainty, for those who travel, those who are seeking or settling into new homes, and for those who are lost. As we encounter situations of suffering, help us to ask why it is so and how we can help. Lord, we continue to pray for students, teachers, staff, and our school communities as they adjust to another school year like no other. We pray for all who are facing health concerns, health decisions, and health procedures. We ask your blessing upon families, friends, neighbors, strangers, and ourselves in times of need. We pray for healing, for peace, and for your example of hospitality to take hold more and more in our lives and in the world. Through the presence and power of the Holy Spirit, we lift up silent prayers right now for the people and the places that we are holding close in our hearts. Holy One, on this day, your day, we give you thanks. Thank you for the people, the ministries, and the mission of your church, and for all who serve with your love. 
Thank you for growing us and guiding us in your love at all of the ages and stages of our lives. Thank you for the opportunity and the courage to say yes to you, to welcome you into our hearts each and every day. Thank you for welcoming us just as we are and for opportunities to welcome others just as they are. Thank you for the life-giving gift of these words as we pray to you. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We invite all who are able to please stand as we join in singing our closing hymn. Let me walk with thee in lowly paths of service free. Tell me thy secret, help me bear the strain of toil, the fret of care. Help me the slow of heart to move by some clear winning word of love. Teach me the wayward feet to stay and guide them in the homeward way. Teach me thy patience still with thee in closer dear our company in work that keeps faith sweet and strong in trust that triumphs over in hope that sends a shining ray far down the future's broadening way in peace that only thou canst give with thee O master let me Please be seated. So we heard, we heard Jesus say, whoever welcomes one such child of my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. It would be in seminary that Bishop James and Eunice Matthews, daughter and son-in-law of E. Stanley Jones, treated us to a traditional Indian meal. My first experience with curry. Hot, I remember it, but I've come to enjoy it. But what I take away from that was the fact that they, a bishop and Mrs. Matthews, fixing the meal themselves and serving us. Servant leadership. What opportunity might you have this week to help a neighbor, to reach out to a friend, to pray for those who come to mind, to learn more about 
what's been troubling and causing fear in your life. No, you're not alone, but Christ goes with you and will see and journey with us. And in the end, we will all overcome and know his wholeness. Hear these words ascending forth. Go in confidence and peace, joyfully serving the Lord who walks with you. Bring hope to the hopeless, joy to those who sorrow, peace to the afflicted. Be true witnesses to the love of God through Jesus Christ. Amen.